Welcome to the Kung Fu Discussion Group, episode 10. Today we're going to be discussing Nagong in depth. I'm your Uncle Sickness, with me, Yoga Midnight, and the Magister. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? I'm doing good. Excellent. Excellent. So, Nagong uh, is a, a Chinese word. It's a two-character compound. It literally means internal kung fu, internal skill. Nay, inner, internal, inside, that general idea. Gong is a shorthand for gong fu, kung fu, uh, meaning like skill developed over time. So, Nagong is the deliberate long-term systematic cultivation of both internal strength, structural connection, uh, mechanical efficiency, and internal power. Um, you know, we're all experienced martial artists, uh, so I'm sure we've all heard those buzz terms more times than, than any of us care to count, but there is a way to actually approach this in, in kind of a scientific fashion, shall we say. Um, it's scientific because it's, it's a clearly defined procedure, and you can reproduce it. I can tell you the procedure I've used. You can go and practice it. You can have experiences too. The thing that makes it unscientific is um, bodily composition, talent, work ethic, those kind of things. The, the sort of, you know, like in pro sports, what they call intangibles. So let's say you've got a, a, somebody with a, a, a good work ethic, but they're kind of sickly unhealthy you know it's a it's a pretty common story for a lot of the older masters um in most martial arts you know a guy born sickly and weak maybe sick all through childhood starts to practice a martial art as a teenager gets that that good health back and then continues with it and ends up becoming famous for the the practice of their their style um with with nagong <clears throat> It's, it's, um, for you guys that are experienced, it's easy for someone like me to just prove the point. Here, look, this is the procedure. These are the basics. See, you can feel it all, like you can feel it already. For a complete raw beginner, an amateur, somebody that's never practiced martial arts before, maybe doesn't have a lot of athleticism or maybe is really sickly, it's going to be hard for them to understand the procedure and the, the sort of underlying worldview and the application. So it's one of those things where you can't, um, if you both recall, actually, here's a little tangent. Uh, last year, I wrote a decent-sized thread about empty force in the yes. martial arts. You know, the idea that you can, without touching somebody, you can strike them. You can move them, yes. Yeah, and how it's, it, it basically, you, you can't, an experienced person cannot use empty force on a raw beginner, an untrained. Yes. Nagong is similar in the sense that there's a certain level of experience you need for anything said on the subject to make sense. So if you've practiced something like yoga seriously or meditation seriously or learned some of the health-focused Qigong sets, you know, and, and had a regular dedicated practice, it's easier to pick up the um, internal training concepts. But taking somebody that's never you know never played sports as i keep saying never you know somebody that has no experience with their own physicality trying to tell them like feel the chi with your mind lead it with your will you know mm. find your center like that stuff's not going to work for some of these people you know they don't have a basis to comprehend the terms the uh, the internal geography for their own body is just they don't they don't know the lay of the land as it were so they're not going to be able to pick it up easily. But once you do have a little bit of that experience, it's just a matter of catching the knack. 
You know what I mean? So there's this theory that, um, you know, since so many in the past, before the 20th century, in most countries, the majority of people were Ill- illiterate, not educated, couldn't read, couldn't write, you know, if they had a high level skill that they developed in any field, um, they were what you could call a knack master, you know? It wasn't that they went to school and studied and worked the way, you know, a mathematician or a computer scientist would. It's that they did this long, like often enough for a long enough period of time that they caught the knack for something, you know? So with, with the internal aspect of martial arts, the basis is always usually, well, in Asian martial arts, the basis is always going to be chi. Chi for the Japanese, I mean, ki for the Japanese, chi for the Chinese. They say ki in, in Korea as well. I'm not exactly 100% on that, but once, once you get that, the knack for feeling chi, Hmm. Right. Next step. Now we're going to show you how to feel it in, in movement, in circulation. Now, after that, the next step, now we're going to teach you to control that circulation. Now the next step, now we're going to bring you, now you, now you control where it goes. Not just you control it in those preset circuits, the channels and meridians, but uh, right. You want to feel the chi specifically from your center. You want to bring it specifically to, you know, as a Xin Yi example, um, there's the four tips they talk about. The hair. Hair is shorthand for skin, but hair slash skin. That's the, um, I already forgot. <laughs> I think I had one too many of the Jamesons. All right, but so four tips. Teeth are the extension, the tip of the bone, the fingers and toes are the tip of the tendons, the um, tongue is the tip of the muscles, the hair slash skin, tip of the blood. So beyond just like a general basic, like a basic type of chi circulating meditation, like embryonic breathing or small circulation breathing, four tips is right you can feel your chi you can feel your dantian you can feel your chi as it circulates in your body naturally you can control where it goes ever so slightly now we're going to build up that control and the sensitivity and the quality of the chi by having you bring it to something most regular people are not gonna try and think about so using the tongue as the tip of the muscles for this example. The idea that while you're standing in Santisher or doing the holding the ball posture or kind of like a Wuji neutral standing meditation, the idea that you could deliberately lead Chi from your core into the tongue. If you can do that kind of with a good facility, you'll be able to understand uh, applying the chi to isometric muscle training. Okay, isometrics is pretty straightforward. You know, I'm sure we've all experienced it. You guys, you guys yeah, you guys know what I mean. So, if you can augment, um, if you have enough of a grasp on isometrics, that you can turn the practice of your routines, your, you know, your, your uh, forms practice into an isometric training exercise and then augment that with chi. You can kind of, okay. you, you can do more than, than a lay person, a non-martial artist might assume, okay? For, for a non-martial artist, they think it's as simple as just speed and power, right? Okay, but what about mechanical advantage? A five-foot-tall woman that weighs 110 pounds soaking wet, how are they going to mechanically stand up against someone like me? I'm six foot three, I'm 250 pounds. How is 
somebody that's literally half my size and weight, how are they going to compete with me when I have a mechanical advantage? The idea is because you're never going to have longer arms than me if you're five feet tall, the idea is to use quality to overcome quantity, right? So a, a, a smaller person or a woman, they're not going to necessarily outmuscle a bigger person, but they can have cleaner, tighter movements, more efficient movements, more efficient targeting, better speed, better accuracy, better mobility, you know? Why would, why would a, a woman stand there and try to tank shots from a man my size? That's dumb. Somebody smart is going to use footwork to get out of the way of a larger kind of physically overwhelming opponent. So to um, kind of properly capitalize on the opportunities that that kind of mobility and that kind of relative positioning can, can give a person, you use the nagon. You want to build up the quality of the muscles. You know, you might not, you, you, again, using a similar image, you can take a very large person and a slightly below average person in terms of size. If the bigger person is just relying on dumb, unrefined brute strength, and the smaller person has sort of refined their kinesthetic awareness, um, you know, increased the percentage of muscle fibers that they use to perform a given set of physical actions, increased the efficiency of their mechanics and their posture, they can take advantage of those, those gaps that exist automatically in all of us if that makes any sense. Um, one of my, one of my uh, ancestors, shall we say, in my, my martial arts lineage, um, my Shinyi and Bagua, and therefore Matt's as well, is descended from uh, Sun Lu Tang. Very famous guy, wrote a lot of books. He's one of the first people uh, in the early 20th century to say that Shinyi, Bagua, Taiji are one family of martial arts. He's the one that coined the, the idea of internal, external styles. Well, he didn't do it deliberately, but he's the reason why we have that dichotomy nowadays. So the idea was that, um, how to put this the best way? If you, all right. If you can't, I feel like I'm going in circles here. If you can't compete mechanically, you have to have, if you're not going to, you're not going to have more quantity, you have to have better quality. 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 Quality will beat quantity. Um, it doesn't seem like it should be that way in martial arts to an outsider, but, you know, once you really get into the world of martial arts, you realize, you know, you watch Enter the Dragon, you see Bruce Lee, beat O'Hara in that fight. How did he do it? He's half this guy's size. He's, you know, half this guy's weight. Well, faster, stronger, more accurate, you know, better perception. It's, it's always going to, it's quality always beats out quantity. So the basic idea of Nagon is we're going to take what you have naturally, whatever it is, whatever quantity of strength you're born with, whatever quantity of athleticism you're born with, we're going to take that and we're going to make it qualitatively better. It's essentially a less spiritualized, less um, fantastical application of the same logic that is in um, Chinese alchemy, internal alchemy. That, um, the internal alchemists, uh, as a way to kind of make that clear, they, it was religious Taoism 
their meditative um, techniques were were transmitted it, in the guise of alchemical formulas. Okay. So, questions. I, I actually bought a book two weeks ago on Taoist meditation and uh, just going through it. It's something that I realized that uh, comprehending some parts of it right now is beyond me and I'm going to need some help. So that's just an aside. Let me, I'm listening to you. Mm. So it's actually perfect for the subject because um, Taoist meditation in general but specifically the conceptualization and terminology used in the internal alchemy um, practices, that is the actual basis of the theory and the technical terms for um, Nagon in the internal martial arts in general in China, but especially Xingyi, Bagua, Taiji to a lesser extent. Uh, Lu Herbafa or uh, Tong Bei Chuan, like the inter the styles that put more than fifty one percent of their theoretical efforts into internal stuff. Um, it's all rooted in that. So if you can, if you don't have a, like a person that doesn't have a lot of familiarity with um, the the Nagon concepts or is having trouble kind of getting used to them and understanding the the, the thrust of, of the theory uh, I like to have a person like that read some of these al um, internal alchemy books or Taoist meditation books because this is like that's that's where it comes from um, you know my personal you were saying no I said I understand thank you my uh, my personal favorite uh, type of meditation, uh, the Taoist uh, sitting in emptiness uh, style. It it's, comes from uh, my favorite philosopher, my favorite book, the Zhuangzi. You know, there's a passage where um, one of Confucius's disciples comes to him and is like, "Yeah, yeah, you know, I've made progress." Confucius is like, "Oh, what do you mean?" And he tells him, "Like, yeah, you know, this, this, this." You know, I can kind of empty my thoughts out. He's like, yeah, okay. Confucius says, yeah, but there's more than that. You need to keep going. So there's a bunch of that kind of, you know, exchanges. Then it gets to a point where the, the disciple says, I, I, I finally got, I, I, I sit in, I, I sit in emptiness. I just sit and forget everything. Confucius says, what do you mean? He says, well, thoughts fall away. My perception of my body falls away. You know, everything, everything. It's like a complete, it's not unconscious, still conscious, but it just kind of enter a, a void state. So, you know, Confucius does a, whoa, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Most types of meditation um, in China, they're very typical. You know, if you've done a lot of research into meditation, you see... Most people in the 20th century, and now we're in the 21st century, you know, most people in the world are very influenced by Buddhist ideas about meditation. Um, so when most people think about meditation, they've got a very preformed idea in mind, and they don't realize that there are alternatives. Um, the Taoists kind of looked at it as when you want to rest your body, you go eat a meal, clean yourself up, go to sleep, right? That's how you recharge your body when you're exhausted. Their view of meditation is when you're mentally exhausted, confused, disordered, you know, getting, getting pulled here and there by desires, by the world, responsibility, obligation, all that stuff. What do you do? You need to do the psychological, mental equivalent of what you do to remedy physical exhaustion so in the earliest um Taoist meditation texts they refer to their style of meditation as cleaning out the lodging of the spirit you know your mind 
is where your spirit lives. If you want your spirit to be settled, calm, stable, strong, you got to make sure that you're not going in too many different directions at once mentally. So you sit down and you deliberately reduce mental activity as low as you can. The lowest possible point is a place where you're conscious, but there's no running internal monologue. There's no constant voiceover in your head as you narrate your own activities. And, you know, there's no, there's no reinforcing momentary emotions or obsessing over, you know, occurrences or circumstances. So with that as the basis, if you're going to try and practice specifically you know, the Nagong I've learned, Xingyi, Taiji, Bagua. You've got to get a handle on this empty conscious awareness type of meditative state. It's, it's, it's a, a situation where you're sort of anything going on in here that you're responsible for or that you're worried about, you, you put that to the side. And now you only pay attention to what's going on with the body. You know, the world falls away. You're only in the body. Um, to bring it back to the sitting in emptiness, uh, Zhuangzi example, going even beyond, like even throwing the body away would be the ultimate state. So for a martial arts purpose, we're coming, you know, we're coming up to like level eight out of 10. You want to throw away everything in the world. You want to throw away your concern with the external world and only be concerned with what's going on in the body. So you start paying attention to things like resting heart rate, breathing pattern, postural habits, mechanical habits. So uh, if you pay any attention to like fitness, excuse me, weightlifting, stuff like that. You know, you'll, you'll be in a good position to think about stuff like posture, about, you know, mechanical and muscular engagement. If you want to build up your back, this is how you exercise the back muscles. This is how you put yourself in a position to succeed. If you want to build up the legs, you know, this is how you do squats. If you want to, you know, you want to lose a gut, this is how you do sit-ups. Like it's, it's that kind of idea. So I know this is rambling. I apologize. So when you do it in a, when you're doing it in a, in a martial sense, thank you. I appreciate that. When you're doing it in a martial sense, it's not, how do I stand up straight? How do I get rid of that hunch in my back? How do I, you know, stop having the, the neck lurch forward and put it straight up? How do I get my <laughs> shoulders to drop? How do I, you know, how do I, how do I stop? curling my hips too far forward, too far back, whatever, you know? You start to get to a point where, you, where what you want to be looking at is how do I increase relaxation? Yeah. Right. So if you're always mentally tense so that the shoulders start to rise like this, obviously, muscle tension kills relaxation. Right. You start to work on that. Okay, so you're not clenching the muscles anymore but they're still, you know, shoulders are still up here, right? I want to work on getting those down, getting that head up, right? Now you're starting to get a better situation, you know? Um, when, you, when you've got yourself to a place where you can have a good amount of psychological and physical relaxation simultaneously, Without much effort, you'll start to spontaneously feel the chi, the internal energy. So in my experience, uh, the mistake that a lot of people make when they start to study this kind of stuff is they've got a lot of psychological tension. They've got a lot of physical tension. They've got poor movement habits. They've got poor self-care habits, psychologically, shall we say. But they want to go right to 
I feel the chi in my body. I feel my dantian. I lead it here. I lead it there. I emit it from my hands. I do this. I do that. You know, great. That's a good ambition, but you know, this is a little chauvinistic of me, but if you're 20 years old and you can't even stand up to your full height because you're just so fucking tense all the time, you're not going to feel chi. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And unfortunately, a lot of people all over the world have this idea that there's some kind of shortcut, you know? Mm. Uh, we all spend time on social media, so we've all encountered, you know, those people who are vegans, and it's like their religion, and they're completely insane about it. Right, okay, you yeah. don't eat meat, you're more fucking relaxed than me, oh, whatever, okay, but you still chicken neck, shoulders up, you know? ass is rolled back so the back is tight you have no flexibility in your legs you're walking on your heels or you know mm -hmm. great great you aren't emotionally polluted the way i am but you cannot stand up to your full height so what are we going to do here yeah well also it's like not um i because i just i got that book that you'd recommended before like a Taoist view of chinese thought yes and, excellent uh, I just, you know, I just was reading through the preface. I was doing a lot of stuff last week, but it, you know, like, you know, you know, the just, you know, as you know, in the introduction, he's talking about that the Taoist approach to, I guess, like self improvement or whatever. It's it's not that it's not cognitive. It's not deconstructive, and it's just making me think about how because like through through Taoist practices, we can you know, we can tune into that pre heaven state, you know, that there's yeah. that bliss of releasing all the, you know, or like a great, the, the greater body of um, confusion that comes with living in the modern world. Yeah. But it, but then it's frustrating because like not only the modern world is like saturated with like anti relaxation. And on top of it, people who think that they're evolving by like increasing that confusion and increasing dependence on, like um like allegory of the cave shit you know what i mean and yeah. try, instead of like getting out of like getting to the true forms like fixating more on shadows you know what i mean like narrative you know like living in their narratives instead of just like like seeing things as they are or like yeah. understood you know yeah 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 it's it's that's that's a, a nice example of the problem in xingyi bagua taiji practice these are martial arts they were originally martial arts. They were made to fight other martial artists. So why has it been 120 years since anyone's been able to win a fight with Tai Chi Chuan? You know, mm. it's this idea. Well, like, you know, it's, it's pretty common. They talk about it all the time uh, on the internet when they discuss martial arts. You're not, you're not gonna beat a guy when you have zero physical strength, you know? If, if you're yeah. both going to the gym, working out and practicing, doing push-ups, working on your nutrition, and all I do is sit there and move slowly. And, you know, I want to, that's not going to work. You know, why, why are, um, you know, two years ago, mixed martial artist, Xu Xiaodong, anonymous taiji master who said he could blow up the fucking universe with his chi they have a bare knuckle fight mma guy shu xiaodong labels this taiji master directly in the mouth as soon as the fight starts and this guy like you can see when you watch the video he came this close to saying you're not allowed to do that no it's a fight you said fight not compare self-aggrandizing delusions of power or spirituality a fight is a fight mma guys beat traditional martial artists when the mma guy spars and the traditional guy yep. only does routines or only does non-competitive cooperative practice you can't um if you both re uh recall when I sat down, um, the first episode of Crossing Hands, when I sat down with Jonathan Pritchard, we touched a little bit on, on like chi sao and stuff and, and different mecha like mechanics and all that. That stuff is useless if you aren't going to also 
make preparations to be punched directly in the solar plexus, directly in the face, direct, you know, like you, you have to, you have to have both sides of it. You can't just do the chi. Mm -hmm. You also have to do the, the body. You're not going to win without muscle. You're not going to win without, you're not, you're not going to become a good fighter or a capable person who can defend themselves without fighting. So, you know, as a personal example, uh, I started martial arts uh, at 18 when I, when I left my hometown and went to college. Um, plenty of people I had gone to high school with had, had a couple of years of experience under their belt already when I started formally studying. By the time we were in our mid-20s, none of them could, could beat me, and they wouldn't spar with me. Uh, I'm thinking of somebody in particular, <clears throat> the man called, <laughs> man called Tubbs, you know? He, he beat me before I started to take it seriously. He could beat me because he had sparred and I hadn't. I was trying to run on just pure athleticism, pure talent or whatever for, you know, the ages of 20 to like 22. When I started to actually formally study, started to engage in structured systematic training, structured systematic partner practice, relatively structured systematic sparring, by the time I was 24, you know, it, we got into a situation where I could, I could do this and Tubbs could come up here on a blind angle and he wouldn't be able to land the shot even though it was a blind spot, you know, because you don't fight anymore. I do fight. So the fighter wins. Xu Xiaodong, the MMA guy in China versus the Taiji master. The Taiji master only did cooperative, non-competitive, non-contact. Mm. You know, you, you touch hands lightly and you gently push, but at no point is anybody punching anybody else in the stomach in the ribs, in the cheek, in the nose, in the, you know, no one's striking anybody else. That's not going to help you if you're in a situation where somebody's trying to punch you in any of those places I just listed. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get, you want to get right with God, you do religion. You want to get physically strong, you work out. You want to be able to protect yourself from physical violence, you have to fight. If, if a person has started to study martial arts because they don't want to be hurt in a, in a, you know, they don't want to be a victim of crime, they don't want to be taken advantage of or bullied physically, right. You don't want to be beat up, you have to fight. Well, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, then get comfortable with being bullied and beaten up. Because the only way to get better at avoiding getting punched in the mouth is to stand there and have somebody else try and punch you in the mouth. Nagon seems like the sort of thing that you can do in isolation of the combative, physical, confrontational, non-cooperational aspects of martial arts. You can't. You cannot. If you take away the combat martial aspect of Nagon practice, it becomes an inappropriate, less effective version of Qigong and the spiritual meditation practices. So, Taiji is great for health, right? When, uh, you know, Yang Shao, Yang Shao Hu and Yang Cheng Fu in the early 20th century started teaching uh, people openly, like teaching the public openly. It's great for health, they said. That was their selling point. My own martial ancestor, I mentioned Sun Lu Tang. Yeah, people should learn Tai Chi, Xing Yi, Bagua. It's great for health. And it was. Those, those were very healthy men. You, you see Yang Cheng Fu, you know, the guy about my size, a, a Chinese man a uh, hundred years ago, almost my size, about 300 pounds. But this guy could move well. Well, he, he had trained to fight. Being combat ready gave him robust health. Mm. The robust health 
that one can gain from Taiji Chuan comes from training to fight using the Taiji boxing method, not from, you know, moving slowly and relaxed. If you just want to do energy stuff or do meditation stuff or do relaxation stuff, there's more than enough of that. You don't need to seek out an internal martial artist. But, you know, if you are comfortable with fighting and you want to find a way to negate mechanical advantage and to a lesser extent, experience advantage, but mostly it's the mechanical stuff. This is, this was so old, th this stuff was developed so that an average or below average size man, my age or older, could beat a big guy your age. You know, how, how, is, a, how is a 50 year old gonna fight a 20 year old? This is how a 50 year old fights a 20 year old. You have to be qualitatively superior. Better mechanics, better power. You know, the, the word that the Chinese use for um, strength or power is li. Depending on the context, it can mean literally physical brute strength, like dumb strength, like a, an ox, beast of burden, whatever. Or it can mean power in the sense of like, you know, different caliber uh, rounds for a firearm. Some of them have more penetrating power than others. There's certain bullets that are real big, but they're not going to go through uh, body armor. Other bullets, they will definitely go through the body armor, through the body, out the body armor in the back. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of, yeah. How do you, how do you, if I'm walking around, like Clint Eastwood in that one Western with a steel plate under my chest, how do you negate that advantage? There's a way to negate that advantage. So you got to train, train yourself to be in a position to take advantage of the gaps that are inherent to any situation. It's a little confusing and disordered to try and talk about this subject because, um, I mean, I, I definitely said this to Matt uh, multiple times over the years, but if you want to get good at internal martial arts, you don't just study martial arts. You also have to look at meditation. You have to look at medicine. You have to look at recovery practice. You have to look at supplemental training or, you know, equipment training as it were. Uh, kettlebells are real popular today. The Chinese had their own, own version of that in the past stone locks basically square kettlebells instead of something that looks like this yeah you know a little it's bit rectangular of what'd you say it, it looks rectangular like a block exactly like a handle i've seen them yeah it's basically like a, a scaled up version of what their padlocks looked like in imperial times so you know, if you've ever worked with kettlebells, you know, they don't just train the, the big external muscles, you know, you're not, you're not just working on the biceps or working on the chest or working on the back. You're also working the tendons and ligaments in the joints. You're working the smaller secondary muscles, the connective muscles, the connective tissue. You're building up the posture as well. So, It's, it's this idea that if you want to get good at task A as your primary, you have all these smaller secondary branching things. They don't seem at first glance mm. to be related in any way to winning fist fights. But if you want to win fist fights, you have to be a little more thorough and a little more prepared. Like my friend Paul says, monsters are real. There are people out there that are just, they've got raw talent that's beyond anything any of us can handle. What do you do 
when you're facing a monster like that, somebody that much bigger than you, that much faster than you, that much whatever. How, how do you even the playing field? Again, how does an old man beat a young man? How does a woman beat a man? How does a child beat an adult? You can't use the direct path. It has to be a little more indirect in a, in a certain sense. So the big idea about Nagong everybody talks about either feeling the chi or finding the dantian okay great um i've got a couple of upperclassmen from from my school dr yang school when i started 20 years ago they had already put 20 years into trying to feel their chi and find their dantian Some of them got it, some of them didn't. But once you find the Dantian, where do you go from there? You know? You can, for meditation, feel the chi, find the Dantian. That's all you need. It'll take care of itself from there. But if you're looking to kind of transform yourself physiologically, you know, structurally, if you, if you want to transcend the limits of the body that you were born with, how is chi? What are you going to do? Where do you go from there? You know, there's a certain, there's a certain procedure, you know, it's like anything else. There, there's a procedure, there's a formula. You have to follow the rules. So we can, it's, it's easy to like read the writings of the old masters, but they don't necessarily mean anything nowadays. You know, as I said earlier, um, Thanks to guys like Sun Lutang at the end of the Qing Dynasty, beginning of the Republic, you know, late 19th, early 20th century, they started using all these terms from Chinese medicine, from Taoist meditation, from internal alchemy, spiritual development practice. They use those um, in discussing their, their Nagong methods. So if you... You can read those those writings, you can read those terms, but it's just like reading the alchemical uh, like the alchemical books, you know. What is what is, you know, combining sulfur and lead? What is, you know, getting the dragon and tiger? Like, what does that mean? All this stuff, all this symbolic language, what does that mean practically? You know, that that's where the the problem comes in because you can't it's hard enough to get people using the same jargon and technical terms for something that's difficult to to comprehend but getting that jargon to match up with um your own bodily experience that's another challenge that's that's beyond that you know it's 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 a challenge that a lot of people don't consider so now that i've rambled and talked in circles take a little moment questions comments anything you guys want to add before we keep going because i'm i am extremely comfortable with sitting here and openly discussing things that are supposed to be very, very secretive, that, you know, some people will charge people, they'll charge students thousands of dollars over decades to try and get, you know, to get to this information. I have no problem just sitting here talking about it. You know, my attitude uh, when it comes to martial arts is if I train and you don't, then I'll tell you all my secrets because you're never gonna catch me because you're not gonna put it into practice, so. But I know you guys who do practice, will benefit from this so is there anything you guys want to clarify from my rambling before i start to uh if i if i may go first uh because i'll probably need to turn off the video in a couple of minutes yep. but this this has already been extremely useful for me because sitting and forgetting the taoist practice of sitting and forgetting is one that 
you, Brad, uh, yeah. strangely enough, introduced to me uh, quite some time ago. And uh, I started practicing it and f as an alchemical form. Yeah. It has been extremely powerful. Yeah. And uh, it changed, I would say, the, the whole point of the alchemy is to change oneself. I, it changed me and gave me an idea of how many transformations that one can go through if one simply forgets some things. I'm now understanding it's going to... <clears throat> Uh, into the physical, uh, combining it with sort of my my isometrics. But the, the forgetting, to give some context, is to sit and to forget, to forget benevolence and to forget cruelty and to forget these virtues and vices and eventually to forget oneself. And that is how one can be conscious of the body. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that has been very useful. Now, looking at your comment about quality versus quantity right and also about the ineffectiveness of people that strictly practice internal arts as, as someone that's i try to spar boxing at least once a week yeah a couple of rounds and i try to grapple every couple of weeks uh that readiness to engage is very hard on the body mm -hmm. uh, but now i I, I totally understand what you mean. When If someone doesn't have that practice, if they're exposed to it for the first time, even if it's, even in form sparring in karate, where it's sort of ritualized, everybody knows exactly what's coming next. That is very applicable. If one simply practices ta Tai Chi, I do some yoga. I don't, I hardly do any Tai Chi. Maybe I do two Tai Chi classes a year. <laughs> Uh, but I can see, I, I know a ninth Dan Tai Chi Chuan master. master. I'm, it's, I don't think if that person doesn't practice some hard styles, I don't think it's possible. Uh, it's, it's totally useless. And I'm not really sure. I think as we, I'm not really sure why a lot of the martial arts have become defunct and, um, People no longer care really about the combat effectiveness, but seem to just care about the ritual and the. And yeah. The pump. I'm not sure why. So yeah. th this, that's my contribution: is uh, sitting and forgetting has been is, is a very powerful meditative process, mm. and uh, isometrics is something that we do practice. I uh, now understanding that finding Dantian and and leading chi is sort mm. of the next level. Uh, it's a good step for me. I will, I will definitely try and understand the exercises that you're going to talk through, even if it seems I'm not here. Yeah. I am here. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, the benefit, uh, of using sitting and forgetting as a, as a basis for martial types of meditation. It's, uh, the big benefit isn't so much in anything that it's going to do for you or or develop in you so much as what it's going to take away from you. So um, a lot of people in life at all ages, in all cultures, all over the world, their biggest problem is that they're getting in their own way psychologically, right? So a person who wants to learn martial arts to defend themselves but who is also afraid to actually do even controlled semi-cooperative sparring they're in their own way psychologically they, they need to that they need to get rid of that fear let go of that fear let go of that kind of obsession uh, obsession that they have so that they can just start to get down to to brass tacks, you know? Um, a very simple kind of preparatory exercise that I learned way back, you know, at 18 years old when I, as I said, when I started, uh, when I first got to college. My teacher basically at the time, the, the guy had me stand half step or so out of the range of his fully extended strike 
So, you know, he holds the fist out all the way. He's like, yeah, see, if you were standing here, I would punch you in the face. Just take a half step back. Right. Even if I go all the way forward, I can't hit you now, he says. You got it? Okay. I say, yeah. He's like, now I'm going to feed you strikes so you can work on your interceptions. I spent two months doing that. So... I mean, I had been in fights as a kid and in high school and stuff, so I didn't have much fear of getting punched in the face. You know, I've been punched in the face a lot compared to a lot of people, but there's always that, that automatic reaction. You know, if, if there's something coming at your eyes, you're going you're gonna to blink. If there's something coming at your genitals or your throat, you're going to, you know, it's a built-in biological response. It's part of the human nervous system. There are certain places your body doesn't take chances. If it looks, it seems like something is going to hit you in one of these vital spots, the body's going to automatically move to defend itself. So to kind of temper those sorts of inborn reflexes to make sure that they're not overactive and further, more importantly, to make sure that they only kick in in an appropriate, um, helpful way, you do stuff like this. In northern China, they call it feeding hand, which is literally, like I just said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to punch. I'm going to pick a uh, target on your body. That's what I'm going to attack. You're going to pick uh, a countermeasure, a defense. That's what you're going to defend with. And I'm, on, like, I'm only going to throw right straight punches at your face or your solar plexus. You're only going to defend it by intercepting with your left hand or your right hand, or you're going to intercept it by stepping this way or that way to physically move yourself out of the line of attack. So those, that's the idea. So there's an element of Nagong practice that's meant to assist that kind of training methodology, right? So you want to, let's say we've got a person who's, you know, random student, you know, Biff or whatever. Biff's never done martial arts. He wants to learn with all of us. So he's part of the group now. Now, Biff understands what to do, but he, he gets tripped up, doesn't move well, can't, you know, he can handle the hand techniques when we're standing still, but when the feeding hand drill becomes, I'm going to strike you in the, in the body and you are going to step in ABC method, you know, you're going to use this stepping technique to physically remove yourself from the danger, you know, maybe he has trouble with that. Right. Okay. This is where the Nagong stuff comes in. The secondary application of Nagong. The primary application of Nagong is increase the qualitative nature of the power. You want to inc imp improve the quality of the energy, the quality of your perception, the quality of your mechanical movement, your balance, your posture, stuff like that. The secondary application is if nobody's trying to hit you, you do everything flawlessly, but the minute someone stands in front of you and does this or this, all of a sudden, you know, can't, can't relax anymore, can't calm down. Right. So as Tommy said, uh, Zuo Wang, uh, Wang sitting and forgetting has been beneficial for him. It, the big benefit is all of those natural, positive, inborn reactions. How do you, how do you put them to their proper use? Yes, if somebody tries to poke you in the eyes Three Stooges style, you should definitely blink to protect your eyeballs. But if somebody 
you know, somebody fakes an eye poke and you close your eyes and then they just rail you right in the nose because you closed your eye. All right. That's, that's, uh, uh, somebody used something positive against you. How do you eliminate that weakness? You practice the nega. You learn how to get in there. You feel how to say this in a way that's that's not going to be loaded with jargon. You learn how to feel. You you like you feel that mechanism in your body. Um, that makes these involuntary things happen, and you learn how to temper its responsiveness or its sensitivity, shall we say? So. You want to be able to protect your crotch, protect your throat, protect your solar plexus, protect your eyes, but you don't want, you don't want that unconscious reflexive protection to kick in at the wrong moment, you know? So Nagong is a way, the meditative aspects of Nagong are a way to make sure you can, you can keep those good things and only have them only have them activate shall we say when you need them you know you want to have you want to have your cake and eat it too <laughs> in a sense you know i'm not sure if that's if that's clear so um Questions, reactions to that? If that made any sense? I'm not sure if that was clear. I feel like I kind of. Uh, so, oh yeah, for one thing I wanted to, was there an ending to the story with Confucius that you talked about? Oh yeah, yeah. The, uh, the ending to that is, well, the actual ending to the story is when the disciple has reached a point where when he sits, everything falls away and he's conscious and aware, but he's not obsessed with anything going on inside or outside. It's, it's this sort of perfect natural equilibrium, the starting point for, for spontaneous um, expression and response to come from. So when, when he explains to Confucius what he means by sitting and forgetting, Confucius is like, wow, that's deep. Could I become your disciple and learn this you know like that and well, there's a you know there's a lot of humorous elements in in the stories in Zhuangzi but the idea was um a, a lot of times the issue isn't it, it's not that a person is lacking more often than not in any endeavor something physical, something intellectual. The problem isn't you aren't doing enough. The problem is you're doing too much, mm. right? So if you're a beginning martial artist and you don't have good stances and footwork, trying to learn bare hand sparring or weapons sparring, that's you don't need that. You, you don't you don't want to try and solve you know problem fifteen when you haven't even solved problem two yet. So the idea is to reduce the extraneous, superfluous, unnecessary aspects. You want to reduce the unnecessary waste of physical, psychological, whatever, energy, you know? Um, nowadays, most people's problems, um, you know, they're, not too long ago, most, m most problems in the world were, where am I gonna get my next meal from? How am I gonna, how am I gonna stay warm during this winter? Mm stuff like that real practical survival problems but we're now in a position in the 21st century in most of the world where people's problems are 
how am I going to balance my obligations with my goals? How am I going to, how am I going to hold up my end of the bargain? I made a promise to my employer that I would do X, Y, Z. How am I going to get that done? And also, you know, live a fulfilling life personally, spend time with my family, have a good relationship with my spouse, whatever, you know? You don't need to add more, you need to subtract more. To make it slightly political, what's the biggest problem in most countries? Government overreach. Too many bureaucrats doing too much dumb shit. We don't need more regulation, we need less regulation. We don't need more inspectors. We need less inspectors. Also, know? I think it's the intelligence community trying to trying to manipulate the game board without being as competent as they imagine that they should be or would be. You know, yeah. they know they can do things, but it always seems it often seems to go awry. You know, right? Yeah, exactly. So like, like, all right, so now we'll make it so that we can just spy on every American citizen and then we can prevent terrorism. Yes. That will, if we spy on all the Americans in America, that will prevent foreigners outside of America from doing things. You can't even say the sentence out loud and have it make sense. Mm -hmm. Martial arts are the same way. I'm going to defend myself from knife wielding muggers and gun toting crackheads, but I'm never going to actually do push ups or fucking punch people. Get out of here. You're not doing that. A lot of people seem, to, I think a lot of, I mean, one thing that's weird about the world we live, like living today, because there's all this, there's, there's a lot of access to information, but then there's a lot of like things that are kind of in the bed, like underneath the bedrock or in the unconscious of, of like any mind that, that create interference. Like, um, like I think that a lot of people have kind of ham handed ideas of like, just in terms of right and wrong, just in terms of like, you know, like maybe Tai Chi master who on some level thinks if you punch somebody in the face that, you know, he's, he's being bad or something, you know what I mean? Or the universal yeah. punishment for protecting himself or something yeah. like that. Like, have you ever, like, have you met, I'm sure that you've met or heard people who are being like, I don't want power. You know what I mean? Like people who are like, power exactly. is bad. Like, you know, you shouldn't be able to defend, you know, like, like the gun thing. Right. right. One of the, one of the key points like, in the 48 laws of power, which the chumps love to quote and fall back on so much is, you know, if somebody tells you, I am not interested in power, that is a power play. Mm -hmm. Unless they're an idiot, it's a yeah. power play. Because you, if you think that I'm not involved in trying to undermine you, mm -hmm. if, if you think I'm not, I'm not part of the conflict that you're engaged in, you're not going to defend yourself from anything I do because you're not going to pay attention to what I'm doing or how mm -hmm. I'm moving. Great. So you learn Tai Chi Chuan because I want to be able to defend myself, but I, I don't believe in violence. Right. Well, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be dumb enough to say, I don't believe in violence, then no martial art is going to help you. Owning a gun and practicing marksmanship won't help you if you're starting from a place of violence is never acceptable. I was trying to find that, but it doesn't matter where the book. Is. I got that other book that you mentioned. Uh, that's like Lao Tzu, um, the um, the old master. Yeah, yeah, that's and a good one. Yeah, it's good. it's really good. And I would just like flip to a random part where it was talking about like some passage talking about executing people. Yeah, <laughs> and how like making these intelligent distinctions where because basically they were saying like you know, if you threaten the people with violence, like let's be a leader and you threaten the people with violence, but their lives already suck, then it's not going to work because yeah. like their lives fucking suck. Yeah. So if, you get nothing less to, if you have nothing left to lose, what does it matter if they're going to kill you? Yeah. That would be better. <laughs> yeah. But then it, it also like makes the distinction that it's like, it's not saying violence is bad. It's sort of like, it's like, it's like, it doesn't even matter. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, it's like there need to be like under certain circumstances, then like, yeah, okay, you can do it like that. You know what I mean? Right. Talking about the morality of violence is irrelevant 
when you're dealing with somebody that's already well beyond the has nothing left to lose point. Mm -hmm. like I think, like, personally, like, talking about politics nowadays, what's the mistake that, uh, that the U.S. government has been making for the last 20 years? For the last 20 years, they've been trying to... They've, they've been trying to discourage and intimidate people who are in, only in conflict with us because they already beforehand felt like I have nothing less. To, if I die, it doesn't matter. At least I won't suffer. You know, mm -hmm. if you're already at a place where death is better than the way that you're living now, yeah, nothing is going to stop you from doing whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So we have that situation in, in the world of martial arts where you've got people who they're, they're playing political games in, in a sparring match. I'm not comfortable with violence, so I'm morally better than you, Matt. And Matt responds by punching me in the mouth. It, you know, there's no moral high ground. It's when so, you're already yeah. fighting, there is no better than violence. There's all, we're already there. Yeah, totally. There's no way to, you know, the moral high ground is for preventing a conflict that hasn't started yet. When the conflict's yeah. already on, then it's about who's going to come out on top. Yeah, so well, like you know, Taoist meditation, it's also wonderful as like a safeguard against this, like, because so many, I mean, I, I haven't lived in other countries. I'm not like shit talking. I'm just like, like people I've met in America who are like friends or adversaries, but adversaries, you know what I mean? Like yes. people, it's like this, well, maybe you should see it through my perspective, which is like a trap that they don't even know they may or not even know is like some kind of twisted trap you know what i mean like like people like it's great i love shingy because of that sort of because there is truth and that you can just be like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> you can just, yes. just like that's one of the best things about shingy yeah it's one of the best things about shingy great great I'm not going to be able to do some sort of ritualized formulaic garbage shit that you and your fucking fellow members of your school do with each other to solve problems. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to punch you in the mouth. Yeah. Also like, um, I don't know where you got the quote from, but I'm like way back when you started to teach me when, uh, that quote, hold she in your heart. That's like, that's been extremely helpful. Uh, because yeah. it's not the same as like obsessional, it's not obsessional loops, but it's like there's pins, you know what I mean? So like if some kind of behavior doesn't, it's like, you know, like that was a lie, you put a pin in it, you know what I mean? And that pin doesn't go anywhere. So the yeah. next lie, you know what I mean? These are connected. So yeah. somebody can be like, what do you mean you don't trust me, bro? And it's like, well, I don't trust you because I fucking listen and I remember the things my body says are important, you know? Right, yeah. Or my style. These are not really cool decorations. They actually work. They function. I can see you. That's why I know you're lying to me. Mm. Yeah. Or as I said, you know, going back to what we were talking about pre-recording, something I am going to say at work this week okay were you lying to me then or are you lying to me now yep it's very simple it's very very simple in some cases fortunately so the idea in nagong as i've been saying talking about quality versus quantity the idea is instead of doing what most people do in trying to train the martial arts and come up with kind of prepackaged responses, you know, I'm going to plan out countermeasures for every possibility that I could find myself in. That's a, that's not efficient because as much as, as, as great as it sounds to say, you should always be prepared for the, unex, you know, expect the unexpected, be prepared for the, you can't really do that. You can't. Because for an average person, they can't imagine things outside of their experience. You, totally. can't, you can't go, you know, humans live in a three-dimensional space. 
asking a human to imagine fucking 19 dimensional space. That's not going to, that doesn't even mean anything. Mm -hmm. I just used a bunch of English words that mean absolutely nothing to the average person. Yeah. What what are you going to do with something that alien, that bizarre, that beyond a person's lived experience? So the, the idea in training Nagong is right. We're not going to worry about what if. We're going to worry about what is. Don't worry about what I might do in a fight. If, if you and I fight, Matt, don't worry about what I might do. Worry about what you can do. Mm-hmm. You, that famous quote from Sun Tzu, if you know yourself and you know the enemy, you'll come out on top every time. Yeah. A hundred battles, you'll always come out on top if you know you and you know him. Right. So watching other people, interacting with other people, fighting with other people, that's how you get to know other people. But meditation, solo practice, solitude, self-reflection, honesty. That's how you know yourself. So you're not going to do well if, if you don't pay attention to the opponent and you don't know anything about yourself, you're going to get pasted every time. Yeah, totally. If you know about you, but you don't know how people are, you'll win some, you'll lose some. Mm. Same with, you know, you could spend all day people watching. My entire family, more, my mother's side is more t- like prone to this than my, my father's side, but both sides of my family do this. People watching. Great. You know, I got, a, I got an aunt that's 60 years old. Spent her whole life people watching. That's great. But she doesn't really... All of that time is essentially wasted. It's the same as when she's asleep or when she watched TV. Because... She doesn't know, she doesn't know anything about herself. Mm. You know, you, you can't, you can't spend all your time. And again, this is part of the reason why we have the internal external dichotomy, the distinction. You can't spend all, I can't spend all my time worrying about Matt, worrying about Tommy, worrying about Alex, worrying about my girl, worrying about my, my subordinates at work. You can't spend all your time out there. Mm-hmm. because you might find yourself in a situation. Personally, I was like that in my early to mid-20s. I spent a lot of time paying attention to what was going on out there with the others, with the enemies. And that's why I got so many knives slipped between my ribs by people that were supposed to be my friends. Mm. You know, a very particular crazy girlfriend who actually did stab me more than once. Why did that happen? <laughs> Because I wasn't paying attention to the person who looked angry and had a knife and was standing behind me. I was watching the guy across the street that wasn't paying attention to me and had nothing to do with me. That's why I took one in the, you know, that's why I took one in the side. So that's, that's what you get. What I love about the martial arts is that these things that we're talking about now as a discussion, it's a, it's not abstract. It's easy to understand, but What's the point of having this discussion just as a discussion, as a theory? You can benefit from this because you're an above average intelligence individual. But for a regular person or a dummy, you know, you could talk till you're blue in the face. It yeah. won't help. God, that's so, like, yeah. With the martial arts, even if you're a dummy, if we stand there and we put our fists up and I repeatedly land, a particular blow because you keep making a particular mistake. Whether you understand the grand highfalutin philosophy of it all or not is irrelevant. You're going to fucking learn because you're going to gain body knowledge. Every time I do this, I get blasted in the mouth. Right. Something's going on here and I don't understand, but I need to avoid that. 
So Nagong is this way to kind of put somebody in a position where they might not understand the theory, but as long as you can get the first sensation, you'll be in a position to get the second. And then if you can do that, the third, and then if you can do that, the full, you know what I mean? So we, we kind of systematically, progressively build something, but it's not the same procedure or formula for every individual. Okay. So you and I both practice Xing Yi. So I can use Xing Yi jargon, Xing Yi terminology, Xing Yi procedure. And I can say this to you in a way that is essentially coded for an outsider. They're not going to understand what we're talking about. They won't get what I'm saying, but you'll get what I'm saying. Great. So what, how I would present it to you, what I would emphasize with you is going to be different than what I would emphasize with another person. The way I tell you to think about this is different than the way I personally think about it for myself. Because even though we have um, so, like a similar, ba you and I are, are a good example for this because we're physically pretty different. We have some similarities in our outlooks and personalities, but we also have some pretty noticeable differences too. But it's still, there, there's things that I can do that I can teach you because you'll be able to do it too based on what we have in common. Mm. Alex, physically, as an example, he's closer to my size, but he doesn't have the same sort of like potential that I do. And I don't mean like, oh, I'm, you know, he's down here and I'm up. No, I mean. Like waiting talent? Yeah, like if, if you're using, like, that's no, it's not, I'm not talking about like a talent type of potential. I just mean, um, let's, let's use, Let's use comic books to explain this idea. Naruto. They talk about, they use the five element theory to describe the basics of their chakra. Chakra is what uh, people use to do crazy supernatural things in the Naruto manga. So physically, Alex and I are more similar than Matt and I. But Alex has a different chakra type than me. I'm a wood type. Alex is a fucking water type. I'm not going to be able to teach him certain things because even though we're the same size, it's, we're coming from different places, like coming from different starting points. So you might be f shorter than me, but you're a wood style type, right? I can teach you certain things that I can't teach other people mm. because it's not about, again, Nagong. The Ne means the internal. We're talking about a certain type of psychological disposition, a certain type of logical disposition, like certain tendencies. You know, I can say certain things to you and Alex, and you're going to go exactly to the same place that I'm going with that. He's not going to go there because he's not starting from the same place. He doesn't have the same not only are the types of assumptions that he makes different, shall we say, but he's got a different starting point than you do. So when it comes to, when it comes to Nagong stuff, there's an element of tailoring the training to the individual, not just to their needs, but also to their strengths, their tendencies, their habits, their, their like, their personalities, shall we say. Like you, you can't, all right, I used, to, I used to have this problem at the museum where people would say, they would describe problems that they had socially. And I would say, just do ABC. And the response would be, well, that's easy for you to say, Brad, look at yourself. You know, I can't, visitor services girls, these little, little college girls. Oh, I'm having this problem in my life, blah, blah, blah. I'd say, just do this. I can't do that. I'm not a mean looking, scary ass, six foot tall man with a full beard. I'm a little tiny girl. You know, right. 
if I, I can't tell a small woman to handle, um, you know, aggressive attention the way I, you know, if a man is paying attention to me aggressively, my response is going to be a hell of a lot different than some, you know, 19 year old girl. That's a, like a, you know, a little waif. I can intimidate other people. Somebody smaller than me is not going to go around intimidating other people. They need to have another another way to approach the problem. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Nagon okay. is similar. It's the same procedure. What you're going to do is exactly the same as what I'm going to do. But you might need to come in at a different angle than I would. You know what I mean? Alex is going to have to come in at a different angle than either of us would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, personally... When I was first learning the Nagong stuff, my problem was I had been holding myself back my entire life up to that point. You know, I had always been bigger. My enti- as far back as I can remember, I had been bigger than everybody else my age. So I was always pulling my punches in a fight. I was always holding back at sports. So... I had to come to this, this, when I started doing martial arts, I was pleased, overly pleased to be in a context where I could finally cut loose and go all out. All right. So now I've been, I've been pulling my punches for 20 years and now I'm finally in a place where I can use 100%. Great. Well, that, that put me in a position where I was using too much Lee, too much raw, dumb, muscular force Mm -hmm. not enough mechanical precision Mm -hmm. not enough targeting not enough aim not enough not enough finesse too much brute force so nagong for me was about learning how to get sensitive you know fine tuning Getting, getting down all the way down to the nitty gritty, being able to feel every part of my body, being able to relax every part of my body. Subtle movements, subtle articulation. That's what I had to focus on. I didn't I find the difference between, because this is what I want to ask. Um, and I don't know how to articulate this completely, but since starting uh, to train using Scott Meredith's method, hmm? um, when, you know, practicing Xingyi before, there are definitely times where, you know, it could feel like just like empty practice, you know what I mean? But it definitely mm-hmm. developed like, like chi sensitivity through it, you know? And, and when I was like, even, even when I started out, when I was doing it a lot, you know, it was like, I got really fucking full of like high, like full of energy, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I would practice it and it would just be like, you know, I acted like, you know, I got all like manic, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. like when I started to develop game or whatever, but then, but how do you def- but then this like hidden energy from the method that he teaches mm-hmm. how do you how do you define the difference between them like in terms of like you know what she because i also I, I started reading this manachia book and you know it's kind of it's not rocket science but he was talking about like electromagnetic like scientifically verified reality of chi being yeah. this like electrical mag you know electromagnetic yeah. activity in the body yeah so you know, so when people are like, it's imaginary, it's like, no, you're a fucking idiot. It's not. But so, but again, like, so what's the distinction between like normal chi and then that hidden chi? Uh, okay. Um, normal chi is water. Ming Jin is a super soaker. Anjin mm, yeah. is waves in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Cool. And Hwajin well, is Hwajin is like psychic powers. How do you spell Hwajin? H-U-A. Hwa. Like transformation, change. It's a real simple basic character. Um, it, it's, it's essentially a it's so fundamental a concept in their language and their theory of mind and view of the world that it's one of the things that's a radical, mm-hmm. you know, a, 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 in, in 
the pictographic language that the Chinese use, um, there are different components to the, the words, the characters. There's elements that indicate um, the sound. There's elements that indicate the idea. And then there's elements that classify things into different, different ways. So you get like homophones in Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for us in English, there and there, two different spellings, but the same pronunciation, but they mean two completely different things. Yeah. Well, they have this thing where if you add an element, to a character, it can change the meaning, but not change the sound. Mm. There are other elements that you can add that will modify the meaning, but change the sound. There are elements you can add that will modify the meaning and change the sound. Mm -hmm. So there's like a phonetic aspect and sort of an ideographic aspect. And that's where a lot of the confusion, like the problems, with using the uh, internal alchemy uh, and medical terms as a basis for the jargon for, for Marshall Nagong, that's where a lot of the problems come up. Because sometimes the character that's always written in like a, like a text documentation of the procedure this is the traditional word that you write when you use this, but it's only the correct sound. And it's actually like a, you know, we said hua, you know, all right, hua in huajin is uh, a word that means like change, transformation, that sort of thing. There's another hua that means flower or petals or, you know, like that, that kind of thing. So you can start playing these word games, hua, hua. You say hua, they sound the same, but do you mean transformation or do you mean, you know, are you talking about flowers as an image or do you mean something about the construction of flowers? Because you know how flowers have like an inter, you know, petals and unfolding and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in Northern Chinese martial arts, there's mei hua, tang lang chuan, plum blossom, praying mantis, boxing. Um, what the hell, you know, obviously the mantis part, you want to imitate the kind of tendencies and strategies that the insect, the praying mantis uses when it engage, whatever. All right, so that, that part's obvious, but what the hell does the plum blossom part have to do with? Have you ever seen, you know, flower on a, on a it's, it's a five petals and they're all sort of interconnected. They're individual unique petals, but they're all connected to one base. So it's sort of a, a way of saying there are multiple possibilities from one starting point. Mm -hmm. In Xing Yichuan, the five element, Wu Xing theory, five phases theory, five elements theory, that's a big underlying conceptual metaphor used for structuring the theory and the practice. Okay, so when you talk about P Chuan, P splitting belongs to metal. What the fuck does that mean? Right, this is a code language for these things. So getting, getting somebody who's a raw beginner with no experience to a position where they can follow a conversation between you and I using these, these terms, this jargon. That's a big challenge, you know? And as long as, as long as we, as long as we make sure that a, a, the, that a beginner isn't confusing our intention, our definition, of a term with some other definition of a term, you know? You can see like it's, it's pretty obvious how, how much of an issue it can be to try and take somebody who, you can't start talking about using chi to augment a strike 
with somebody that has never felt chi, period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they felt chi, but they've never felt it inside their body. Or they felt chi outside and inside, but they don't know where their dantian is. You know, like there's all these roadblocks that get in the way in trying to talk about it. So that's why it has to be one of the nice points I like about Shin Yi theory is they will repeatedly say it can't be rushed or forced. Yeah. It comes in, it comes in time. Maybe it'll take me a week to get it. Maybe it'll take you a day because that's, that's like our relative level of talent relative level of experience relative level of capability you know yeah. if you have to lose 200 pounds before i can start teaching you the stances and the steps and the basic movements that's going to put you you in a different position to start from than somebody who's like they're already an athlete and they're already in great shape and they already only have 4% body fat, and, you know? So that's where the tailoring to an individual part comes, uh, comes into play and, and makes the big challenge. But essentially the idea is you want to understand what she is. You want to understand how it's generated in the body and then you want to understand what you're supposed to do with it, right? So what is chi? It's energy. What is energy? You have the same problem in physics class, you know, in any school. You remember the definition of energy? from science class in high school, energy is the ability to do work. What does that mean? <laughs> right. In the martial arts, I can show you. What do I mean by energy? Put out your hand. I'm going to show you what chi is, you know? And we've talked about that, the chi ball, this and that, and all these little basic ways where you can, you can get that you can get a, a, a grasp, you know, get a foot in the door. What we're talking about here. Great. Now you feel, you can feel chi. You know what we're talking about when we say it. How is chi generated? Generated by the mind. So most people nowadays in internal martial arts, they're conflating the first and the second step. If you don't know what chi is yet, or you felt chi, but you don't know how it's generated, trying to find your Dantian is a complete waste of time. Chi is generated by the mind, by intention. You think it generates chi. How do you pick up I've got a pen sitting on this table next to me to my right. I'm going to pick the pen up. How did I do that? The intent to move and pick up the chi was generated in my mind. Unconsciously, automatically, the chi was led to the arm and the hand to activate the motion. This is an incredibly basic, simplistic way of describing things. That's what it is, right? You think it, it happens. That's how you walk, that's how you stand, that's how you go to the bathroom, all that stuff. So, you can feel chi. Now, you know. You think it, it's, it's created. Now, the third step is the chi that you're creating with your thoughts you want to learn, you want to deliberately sink the chi down to your dantian. This connects the mind and the dantian. Okay? From there, it has to continue to sink down to the bottoms of the feet. 
from there, it feels like if you think of the body as a cup, it fills from the bottom to the top. When the whole torso is filled, then you lead it out to the hands as well. Cool. So from there, um, that, that's like, that's a, that's a couple of steps. But that's the procedure for getting the basic foundation. And one of the reasons why it requires time and standing too. I mean, yeah. Because it can, I'm sure that with time, you could get to point, you know, to point B quicker, but you know, you need to like, like you were saying, like building at first, like that kind of, um, cause actually that was the thing recently with, um, that I was going to talk to you about with, um, cause I had read the bone foo, uh, article yeah. that Scott wrote and, yeah. um, and have felt things from it, but then kind of, but then that sort of a, what would he, ARC activation yeah, is what he, what he calls the arc, what I described yeah, generated by the mind exactly, reached yeah. to the Dantian dropped to the feet, brought back up to fill the body and then out to the hands. Yeah. Yeah. Activate rebound catch the bringing it to the hands is the catch the rebound, the, the, activate or accumulate is connecting the mind in the dantian the rebound is once you can feel the dantian as a place connecting the mind in the dantian is building a very simple basic circuit if we're going to use like an electrical um metaphor right you've got you've got a Feeling chi is knowing that electricity exists. Knowing that the mind generates the chi, experiencing that, is knowing that that plug on my wall is where electricity is going to come from. Plugging a power cord into the wall is connecting the mind and the dantian. Right. I've got a place where chi is generated. And now I want to have it go somewhere to do something. Mm -hmm. That's connecting the mind to the Dantian. That's activate or accumulate. Either A is acceptable for the ARC arc metaphor that Scott Meredith uses. The R is rebound in his terms. Once you have a basic circuit built between the mind and the Dantian, you want to take chi from the dantian and bring it somewhere else in your body. Because, you know, as they say in Bagua Zhang, if the lower section, the legs and the feet is off, it doesn't matter if you get hit or not, you're going to fall over anyway on your own. So the rebound part is you want to deliberately start to lead the chi you want to you want to make another further connection from the dantian to the soles of the feet so that your foundation is nice and, and firm. Now, what you find when you do that is that you, you've got a compound increase in the quantity of energy, the quantity of chi, right? Two circuits transmitting power. Mm -hmm is more quantitatively than one circuit generating power, right? So once you, you have this extra circuit built from the Dantian to the feet, you're going to start to have this experience of chi filling up your body, like the circuit from the head from the mind to the Dantian will give you an experience of chi accumulating and filling the torso. If you do any kind of chi circulation based seated meditation, you will have that experience. When you do the small heavenly circuit up the back, down the front, 
chi circulation or embryonic breathing from the mind right to the dantian back and forth. What you're trying to do there is you're sitting still, you're keeping your arms relaxed, empty, folding your legs, keeping yourself completely still. What you're trying to do there is emphasize the connection from the, from the mind to the physical center of gravity. Build a circuit there that's gonna fill up that area. This is, this is why the, it's a mixed metaphor thing that can be difficult for people to understand. You're building this connection along the lines of what an electrical circuit is. But it's like you built an electrical circuit that then fills an empty space up with water. Do you know what I mean? Cool. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you, you eventually get to a point where you reach um, – you reach kind of like a threshold, you know, again, electrical theory, threshold voltage. Some circuits don't do anything unless you reach threshold voltage. Anything below threshold voltage, even though there's power in the circuit, the circuit registers as inactive. It, it has no effect. It performs no function. But once it reaches threshold function, there start like threshold voltage, there starts to be an output, there starts to be a functionality. Right? So activate. You you get the mind and the center of gravity connected. You build that circuit. Now there's chi flowing from where it starts to a place that stores chi. All right. Now you start to store a little bit of chi, you know, you build it up to a point where when I sit down and close my eyes and mentally and physically relax, I immediately feel chi sensations in my body weekly. Now I've built this circuit. The chi has a goal. It has something to do. Mm. Now, instead of just passively existing, it's actively doing something. Okay, right. Now I've got this feeling of chi flowing, maybe in a line, maybe, you know, you want to use the image of like two points connected by a string. You want to expand that string to the point where it's just a giant column. Well, how do you do that? Most people make the mistake of like, oh, when I think in a calm, relaxed way, I generate this amount of chi so i'll fucking fire it up and super intensify that that's not going to work physical and mental yeah. strain and exertion burn chi relaxation not only allows chi to flow it allows chi to accumulate you can't accumulate firewood if every time you chop a log in half you take both pieces and throw them in a fucking fire right it's the same idea with chi Relaxation, breathing, calmness, mentally reducing your amount of, of stress and whatever, right. That's going to help you generate the chi. But if you generate it and then burn it off immediately, it's useless. You need to generate it and accumulate it. It doesn't take much. People waste, as I've said, people waste... 10, 20, 30, 40 years practicing internal martial arts, trying to, uh, trying to uh, like build up chi by burning chi, mm. you know, that whole idea. You know how some people say, like, some people will say, like, oh, you got to spend money to make money. Do you? Do you? <laughs> you know, if you if you make twenty five grand a year, you are never going to become a millionaire, no matter how much you scrimp and save and penny pinch. You don't need to reduce your expenses; you need to increase your income. Mm -hmm. So this is an idea where you're gonna you're gonna reduce your stress so that you can feel the chi. You're going to increase that relaxed state 
so that more chi will flow. Now you've got chi flowing at will on command. So you want to be able to accumulate it in the Dantian. Now you have it in the Dantian. You have that circuit, as I've already said. The mind and the Dantian are connected. There's a circuit that generates chi. What do you do with that chi? You want to amplify that chi. Stress and strain and effort aren't going to amplify that chi because stress and strain and effort eat chi. So you're going to use, again, like I said, water metaphors, electricity metaphors mixed. You're going to find a way to amplify that voltage. So you drop it down to the feet. That rebounds back up to the Dantian. Now there's a second circuit. It starts to have a resonance effect. You have extra chi. So your body is filling up, your torso is filling up with chi generated by the mind coming down to fill the Dantian. That's a slow burn, right? You take one little tiny little faucet of water to fill up a, a swim, you know, one garden hose to fill up a swimming pool. It's going to take forever. But if you put two hoses in to fill that pool up, it's not going to take as long, right? Well, imagine if you just, you know, that's the idea. So we build this second flow from the Dantian to the feet. Now there's a resonance. Two fields of energy start resonating with each other. It's a situation where the whole is great, the, the greater than the sum of its parts kind of thing. The whole becomes more. There's, there's more there. So you've got chi, instead of one point generating chi, slowly, slowly. So now you've got a second point. They, those fields interact. The interaction is another source to create chi. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Now you've got more chi than you did before. So what do you do with it? You do the same thing you did once you connected the mind to the Dantian. Now you lead it, instead of leading it to the legs this time, because you already got the legs involved, you lead it up to the hands. So for your benefit, I mentioned the four tips earlier. People have trouble with the fingers and the toes being the tips of the tendons or the fingernails and the thumbnails. I mean, the toenails being the, the tips of the tendons. What does that mean? If you stand, you know, you hold the hand position for standing in Santee share, right? You get that structure right. I have no physical tension or exertion in this hand structure. I'm just... My fingers naturally go this bolt straight. My palm naturally rounds this much, right? Now, I don't physically tense and claw with my fingers, tense my hand, tense my fingers. But this physical motion, what I'm doing here, while keeping the relaxed structure, I have the intention of engaging my hands. Now, as we said before, the mind makes the chi, the mind leads the chi. So I built a circuit cool. for the chi from the mind to my dantian. I built a second circuit from my dantian to my feet. That makes a completely independent self-generating flow of chi. Now I build another one. With what's coming up from the, the feet to interact with the dantian to create that resonance, now there's, now there's chi finally being generated by the dantian itself. I lead that chi from the Dantian to the hands. That starts to fill up the hands and the arms. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's ARC in Scott Meredith's terms. That's ARC. Accumulate, rebound, catch. Yeah, the little distinctions are really, it are, are diff, I'm not, I don't know how, I don't know how to say it. It's not that they're difficult to articulate. It's like, it's, it's almost mysterious that it, you know, what it takes in order to, to understand what's necessary. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, like, I've, you know, I've been practicing for a while, so there's, like, a, you know, so that's, like, the advantage I have, because, like, I have, like, a, you know, background it. I have the base. But even what you were just saying about the hands, you know, yeah. like, holding the, you know, like, of the, of the, of the relaxed, but, like, you know, but fully extended, and then just the intention of the hooking. Yeah. But just doing that feels like the chi ball. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, exactly. You know, Exactly. Yeah. So you get the, what's the point of the chi ball? Just doing the chi ball, just the chi ball. That's not going to bring you anywhere. Yeah. But that's a good illustration of every single principle I just laid out in that rambling ass, convoluted ass, confusing ass discussion of building this circuit in your body. This is a nice way in a microcosm to get that feeling. It's just, It's not like it's a more complicated or complex application of that idea. It's just, instead of doing it this much, you do it this much. And then once you can do this, instead of doing it this much, you know, you do this much. Mm -hmm. And it, you go like that. You just progressively build up. And you find that at first there seems like there's a huge insurmountable difference between quantity and quality. But over time, you realize that it's not really much of a difference. Is the North Pole of a magnet different from the South Pole of a magnet? Maybe functionally, maybe in terms of effect, but in terms of like the basic reality, is there a difference? No, there's not. They're two aspects of the same thing. So you start to see over time, quality and quantity, they don't have to be at odds. There's a middle ground that connects them. So it, it becomes easier to kind of reach that goal, shall we say. So, um, I mean, now we've basically everything that I wanted to really touch on, we've, we've gone over. I was hoping that there, it would be more than just, you know, me and you. Um, but we could do like an afterward with Alex, you know what I mean? Like we could do yeah. like a kind of, you know, like a sort of like extras, you know, DVD extras, like, you know. <laughs> so hey, like, there's no reason why there can't be a third discussion group episode going over the stuff. Cause this is, this is the sort of thing there's a lot more to it than just what I've talked about, you know? I mean, obviously, now that you're, you're on the same page uh, as me with the Scott Meredith stuff, I can start using some of his terms, his examples, his concepts to get this stuff across. But now, it, what do you do? Like, w Scott Meredith's work is essentially he's got all these different books, almost a dozen books. And it's all, it's the same procedure that I just described ARC every time, yeah. but it's different aspects. We're going to emphasize this part, the Dantian part, or we're going to emphasize the hands part, or we're going to emphasize the filling up the whole body or a particular body part with chi thing. We're going to talk about, you know, quantitative increase we're going to talk about qualitative uh transformation you know it's, it's it's different aspects different angles different applications you know it's very simple it takes there's a saying about xing yi um you can learn all the you, you know you can learn everything in nine months but never master the style mm -hmm. there's not many routines even if you're learning bare hand and weapon stuff with Xing Yi, there's not many routines. The straight sword, the John form, and the Dao form in Xing Yi are the same. The spear form and the staff form are the same in Xing Yi weapons. You do the same motions. Literally, the routine is exactly the same. It's not just the same names for each of the patterns in the routine. The motions are the same. A John is different than a Dao because a Dao has one edge and a John has two. But you make the same motions in practicing, say, you know, 
five phases linking John. You do the same motions in that routine as you do in five phases linking Dao. Mm -hmm. It's just using this method, this pattern, this, you know, training concept and applying it to the particular strengths of the implement at hand. So the Nagong stuff is the same sort of way. You know, a woman and a man are generally physically two very different beings. But you can use one procedure to maximize the benefits and the relative strengths and weaknesses, advantages of both with one procedure. So that's the idea here. It's a simple procedure that you are going to get completely unique benefits out of. It's just getting to a point where you understand, you know, you get that body knowledge of the basics and then you're, you will teach yourself what you need to know to develop. So that's it. Any, any, any like closing comments, closing thoughts before you and I wrap up? No, it's good. All right. So, Kung Fu Discussion Group, Episode 10, Nagog in Death. I am your Uncle Sickness. With me is Yoga Midnight. We also had the Magister, Tommy, with us tonight. Um, I think this was a productive discussion, even if it was a little rambling and circuitous at first. Uh, I look forward to having this sort of talk again. Thanks, Matt. Where can the people find you on the internet? Uh, so, I... You can find me on Twitter. Sometimes I use it. Sometimes I don't. I, I, I'm a, I'm a lot, I do a lot more stuff on Instagram. But I want to I put a lot more stuff on Twitter. So, you know. Yes, join us in the world of obnoxiousness. I mean Twitter. <laughs> so, again, Kung Fu Discussion Group, Episode 10. Thank you for joining us. Build up your Kung Fu. Stupid. No good. With no talent. You shouldn't talk like that. We can fix your problem very quickly.